Welcome. As we continue the Bach organ talks, due to popular demand, we're going to go a little bit further, and I have three toccatas to share with you. I'm going to start with the toccata in F, BWV 540, but before we do that, because this is one of the pedal, pedal solo toccatas, I think I should talk about pedaling. Now, here organists have a bit of a problem. If you say you've got your driver's license and you're driving a car, and I interrupt to say, oh, I hear you have to use your feet to drive a car, that's incredible, you would laugh. But organists are, it's brought to their attention the whole time that us guys using our feet to play these pedals down here is a big deal. And we just, it's like driving a car, you use your feet. Anyway, why don't I talk about pedaling and go into some of the details a bit more. We have a camera set up so that we can do that, but basically what happened was that in, in Germany around about the 1400s, they decided, let's add something to our, our uh, organs, especially because much of the music they wrote there had what was called the drone effect. So there would be a deep note, and you might be playing... So if you could put that in the feet, now you could do more with your hands. Because you've got two hands instead of one hand. So this idea of feet playing notes took hold, and uh, pretty soon you'd have an octave word. So in other words, from here to here. Uh, and yeah, you could put down a drone. But then composers were saying, well, if we can have that much, why can't you give us a proper, maybe two octaves worth of notes, and then we could really write some decent music. So that's what happened in, in Europe, and the pedal boards got bigger. Instead of just being an octave or five notes or whatever, they got up to two octaves. So if you think about that, two octaves, 24 notes an octave, if you include the black notes, eight plus five, 13, up to 24 notes. Bear in mind, these pipes are the big ones, so they're the expensive ones. And if you're wanting to add notes to the pedals, yeah, it's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, and also, they use a lot of air, so that meant more people pumping. Maybe you had to hire three people instead of one to pump your bellows. England went cheap, and they didn't even get to pedals on their organs until a guy called Henry Willis uh, got into that in the late 19th century. Meanwhile, uh, organs were in Europe, two octaves for sure, 25, and most of Bach's work could be played on the 25 note pedals. Actually, this Toccata in F, uh, we think, well, probably was composed for a visit in 1713 to a place I can't remember the name of, and they had an organ with uh, not just 25 notes, but 31, so it went a full two and a half octaves, which took us up to this high F. <laughs> And sure enough, when he wrote this piece, he made sure there is a high F in it, so all those notes are used. But back to the feet, what can they do? The earliest keyboards were really rather rudimentary, and uh, in fact, they were cut off somewhere about here, and the whole thing was a lot further back, very short little pedal notes, and you, you had to play them rather daintily with the tips of your toes. <laughs> There was no room for your heels to play at all. So pretty much all the music through the Baroque area could be played just with your toes, not having to use your, your, your um, heels. And that very much is what Bach is doing. Uh, all right, a bit more about what we do down here. Um, you, every pedal board is, is slightly different. What we have here, things started off just straight out, straight pedals. Well. That's all very well for your hands to have a straight keyboard like this, but our feet don't work quite that way. We swivel when we go one way or the other. So it's kind of nice if the pedal board has a bit of a concaveness to it, which this does. And as we move up, um, we wanted things to be a little bit higher here. So this is both radiating and concave, and it's a standard for the Royal Canadian College of Organists, uh, American Guild of Organists. It's, it's what we use these days and expect. Not just 31 notes, but actually uh, 33 up to here. And uh, 
did I say 31? Let's get this straight. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. That's right, 30 or 32. And uh, most uh, Bach, 30 will do you just fine. And when we get into the French literature in the Romantic uh, period in the, in the 19th century, you will need to have those extra two notes there. So the organist has to feel their way around with their feet. And there are different traditions uh, of how to do it. Now, given that many pedal boards are not quite the same as the other, it makes sense if you learn to feel your way around. And as I sit here to move my feet forward, I find the gaps between the black notes uh, here and here. And I instantly know there is C, there is E, or B and F. So often you'll see an organist kind of feeling around to find out where to put their, their feet. Now, this is pretty vigorous, and you have to pr work pretty hard you can't do this in bare feet. You'd really be stubbing your toes and hurting. So you need some, some good shoes. And as a matter of fact, it helps for us guys with North American pedal boards if it's a dress shoe with a bit of a, a gap between the heel and the toe. That way you can actually play two notes if you have to. And not hear the one in between. Which means... There are times we could play a chord with our uh, feet. Yeah, the right shoe is necessary to do that. If you find yourself giving a recital on an old-fashioned uh, organ and you've got those real short, straight pedals, well, it's quite an adjustment. Anyway, um, for the way I t do pedaling, I definitely want to be able to feel it around as opposed to just memorizing that if this is F, then this is going to be C up there. That works only if you're always using the same pedal board. And a bit of a shout out here. A lot of those concert organists who take their own electronic instrument with them, one reason is they don't have to adjust to a different pedal board, and then they can memorize the feel from here to here, here and not have to feel around. Uh, Bach certainly w was demanding in terms of what he, he wanted people to play, and the Toccata and F that I'm playing today is got two solo sections where just the pedals play. It's a bit of a hoot the way he starts off the thing because the pedal does nothing for a page and a half. Just put down on F and that's it. And the manuals are doing everything else. Tie, 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 all the way through. And by the way, if I was to show you the music, the difference between this and piano music, as you can see, is we have three staves instead of two. The top two are for the manuals, for the hands but the bottom one is for the pedals. So we get to read that third line and uh, figure out how to do the pedaling uh, for that. Now, five fingers, but feet just one. So I can only really hit one thing at a time, uh, so I can't go like this. Tough to do a scale. You can sort of do it. Just hard, you can do it a little bit faster, but never would you be able to do the type of thing you can do in your manuals. So often uh, music is written for the pedals where we alternate right, left, right, left. That's easy to do, and we can do it quite fast. But don't ask us to do scales, we don't like doing that. Uh, it, it fast scales. Okay, that's my introduction to pedaling, and yeah, I got my dress shoes on, which the only time I ever really wear them, aside from social functions now and then, never in COVID, is when I play the organ. Right, now, we're on to box Toccata in F. I want to start by playing you another Toccata in F. It goes like this. bunch of you are probably saying, oh yes, the Toccata in F by Vidor. Yes, that is right. That was written 167 years later, we think, uh, somewhere around 1879, by a French composer, Charles Marie Vidor. Very exciting piece. And as I've been preparing the Bach Toccata and thinking about the Toccata that you want to hear, really, you want to hear that French one, the Vidor one, but you're not. I started 
looking at the notes, and it is fascinating to find out that the first six notes of both these toccatas in F are the same notes. Here is how Bach starts his. And if I was to play the right hand of the toccata in F by uh, Vidor, up an octave. And all we've got to do, the start is the same. And whereas Bach goes up after that for the A and the F, Vidor goes down for his. So, identical first six notes. Was Vidor paying homage to Bach? I'd like to think so, but I'm not sure. Right, let's put Vidor aside. I can now get rid of this and talk a bit more about um, all kinds of interesting things. As I've said before, you don't know to, need to know diddly squawk about how Bach puts together his, his music, but it really is fascinating when you find out. My wife, Pam, is now a real estate appraiser. So she gets to go into all kinds of houses uh, many times every week, all carefully masked up, of course, and all kinds of protocol. But she gets to see lots of different houses. Every now and then, she'll come back very excited and say, this house has a feel about it. It, it. it just flows all through the house. Then sometimes she'll come back and tell me about a house that is very high end, you know, one of these seven digit places, but it doesn't have the feel. So what is going on there? Is Well, there's some identity that is created in a house and as you move from room to room, it, it carries that with it. Well, in this piece here, that is what is happening, even though this is six, seven minutes long, Somehow it feels right all the way through and when you start analyzing you find out just what is going on Here is Bach once again taking the most simple thing and spinning it into something that is full of energy Excitement builds just when you think there's nothing more that can be said You realize he's only just done the first chapter as he keeps getting more and more excited about things So we have this little theme Six notes what can you do with it? Well, you could put it one step higher, which is what Bach does, and you can kind of change it around a little bit, or here, and um, I don't know, this theme one, he manages to spin this out into uh, quite a length. Here's something interesting. If I was to play and now we get the left hand coming in well you've noticed it's the same thing but it's two bars apart and what he has done is written all of the right hand out for 30 40 50 bars and then he has arranged that the left hand is playing exactly the same thing one octave lower following note for note, and it all works. That's really hard to do. It's really hard to make that, we call that in music, a canon. And he makes that work for a page and a half. And then it is time to take that theme and give it to the feet. And we have a pedal solo after page and a half of just holding on one note, just as though he's saying, Okay, okay, okay. Actually, I do know how to use my feet as I'm playing this new wonderful organ in the court of wherever it was where they now have the high F. Um, yeah, he was there to demonstrate. So we now have theme number one, which I've taken you through. It's kind of a, um, it's, it's, it's fairly calm and expansive, and it goes on for several pages until we suddenly get to theme number two. And here's theme number two coming at the end of this. Here we are. And all it is is... The musicians amongst you will say, well, that's a cadence. In fact, it's a perfect cadence. Um, I'm going to label it the umpa pa theme for reasons which will become apparent later. So it would sound like this. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to label it like that. And Bach, this is actually very important, but for the moment it just sounds like a cadence. And a cadence is from the Latin word cado, 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 whatever. Um, the macabre word in English is um, 
a cadaver, so a body that has dropped down dead. Well, a cadence is dropping down in the bass part. And we have two chords. It makes it sound like the end of a piece. And it's those bottom two there. The fifth note of the scale going down to the first note. And we call that a perfect cadence. If you're making up a piece of music, you come towards the end. Sounds like the end. You could do something else to that and interrupt it. I'm going to get to that in a moment there. But please note, Bach has just introduced some new material after lots of... And we finally get to the end of the second pedal solo. And there we go. We have a little cadence point there. It's all like a waltz theme. Now, let's see what happens at the end of the second pedal solo, because after all this stuff... There's the umpa again, but instead of going and having a cadence, he draws it out and adds another one. Another one. Another one. Another one. Another one. And finally, we have the proper cadence. So this is developing from just one cadence, one umpa pa, one waltz melody into a full-blown extended thing. So we've heard it, yes, the canes. All right, now it is time for something really exciting. The inauguration, what thrilled me, apart from the new direction uh, back there in January 20th, with the fireworks afterwards. And here we have the rocket theme. This is, it's like the fireworks going up. Check out the, the uh, YouTubes and they said, just watch. And this is the fireworks, the rocket theme, and it just heads upwards and then, down come all those glittering showers of uh, whatever they are. So here, here is the theme. And you're going to hear that again and again and again. But being Bach, of course, he's going to get back to theme number two, the waltz thing, and combine it with this. So we have this happen. And there it is. It's going to have that waltz theme in it. One more thing to add, you could interrupt a cadence and instead of going, you can go like this, and then you need to fiddle around, but you can interrupt it and you've got a deceptive or interruptive cadence. Now, Bach is going to use this device several times, but he does something absolutely extraordinary with it, and instead of just going like this in the D minor here, he adds the third inversion of the seventh chord. And you have this very powerful chord. He's going to use this three times in over the course of the piece. And you think he's going to just wind it up. Very powerful. Later on, towards the end of the piece, of course, Bach loves doing this kind of thing. Got three themes, and now he's going to start combining them and put them all together so that we're going to hear the um pa pa, we're going to hear the and we are going to, everything is going to come together in this, this thing, and the, the, it, it's just delightful. I just cannot describe how much fun it is to play this piece. It is fiendishly difficult, and I haven't even talked about the invertible counterpoint where he writes some theme which can go up here or down here or there. It can all be turned over and it still sounds good. Hard to do. And here is the Toccata in F.
just so you know, is infinitely harder to play than good old Charles Marie Vidor's Toccata in F. If enough requests come in, maybe we'll extend this and start looking at some of the French repertoire after finishing off the Bach. Next week, I hope to take you through the uh, Toccata in C, BWV 564. Till then, have a great time. <laughs>